we have to go back into some form of an intrinsic relationship with the land and begin to listen to the message of the land. And this is what these poems are about, spending time with the land, listening to the stories that the land has to tell. Everything that we are comes from the earth. The way we speak, the way we make our clothes, the way we hunt, the way we, everything. And if we ever lose that, we go back to the earth and the earth will tell us. And now here we are, you know, 2,000 years later, 5,000 years later, 15,000 years later, no matter how far we've been disconnected, and we have to go back and listen to the stories of the earth, the story, the song of the earth for that matter, you know. I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. Today we're going to explore our relation to the earth. First, through a story from the Seneca people of the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York, and then through the poetry of Humberto Acabal, a Guatemalan poet whose work has been translated by Miguel Rivera, a healer and ceremony maker from Los Angeles. Miguel is with us on the show today, and we will be talking with him. Thank you for joining me. Let us begin. Once there was a boy who lived at the edge of a village. This boy had no mother and no father, and he often played alone in the bushes at the edge of that village, for he was not treated well by the people there. They called him Gakka, Crow Boy, and the boys and girls would call him names and they would throw stones and sticks at him, so that in fact, Crow Boy had scars on the outside of his body because of stones and sticks they had thrown. And the adults of that village did not treat him well either. They held their noses when they walked past him, for he did not smell very good. And they called him names as well, called him the filth-covered one, and so Crow Boy had scars inside his body because of the words spoken, jeered, and yelled at him by the children and by the men and women of that village. Still all the same, he managed to survive. He made a bow and an arrow for himself, and often he would go into the forest and kill the songbirds there roast them and eat them. So he lived at the edge of that village. And then one day, he decided to leave. And so he took his bow and his arrow, and he began to walk away from that village through the forest. He walked for a long distance, until he came to a river, and he went down to the shore of that river, and he saw there was a canoe there with a paddle in it. He looked around. There was no one nearby. He waited in the bushes for a while. No one came back to get in the canoe. It seemed strange to him that someone had left a canoe right there in the river. But finally he got into this canoe, and he sat down in it and he picked up the paddle. And when he did so, the paddle fit his hand so smoothly and beautifully, it seemed as if it had been made for him. And then he pushed off from the shore, and he began to paddle that canoe. He dipped his paddle down into the sparkling water. It was a beautiful day. The sun was high in the sky. There were white clouds overhead in that blue sky. And as he looked down at the clear, sparkling water, he saw those clouds reflected there. So that after a while, it seemed as if he was paddling through the air itself. And he dipped his paddle down, and after a while, his paddle made no sound. 
seemed as if he was paddling through the air. And then a drop of water fell from his paddle into the river and splashed. And he knew he was in a river. So he paddled across that wide river and to the other side. And then he brought his canoe to the shore and he pulled it up on that shore and he got out. And he walked up a hill that was there through the thick forest. And he came to the top and he heard a rushing sound. And he looked ahead and he saw there was another river on the other side of the hill. And so he walked along that hilltop, along the ridge between these two rivers, until he came to the place where these two rivers met and became one mighty river. And there in that place there was a cliff of stone. And he looked at that stone and he said, This is a good place for a lodge. And so he took some bark and branches and he built a lodge for himself. And that afternoon he killed a songbird in the forest. And he came back and he roasted it over a fire. And after he had eaten, as the sun went down, he went to the edge of that cliff and sat on that stone. And he looked out at the two rivers becoming one. And he looked out at the darkness and the stars. And then a voice spoke and said, Would you like to hear a story? He looked around. Was it someone playing a trick? Was it the wind or some sound in the rushing of the river? There was no one there. Would you like to hear a story, the voice said. And now Crowboy realized that this voice was coming from the stone itself, the great stone that made that cliff upon which he was sitting. And he said, yes. And the stone said, then give me some tobacco. Now Crowboy had some tobacco leaves in a deerskin pouch he'd brought with him. So he pulled these out and held them aloft in the air, and then he let them fall so they fell down to the base of the cliff. And then the stone began to speak. And the stone told him a marvelous story about the world before this one, and about a being called Earth Holder, and about a woman named Sky Woman, and how she fell through a hole in that world through the air and how in her hands she had seeds from that other world, and how she landed on the back of a great turtle, and how there was dirt on the back of that turtle from the claws of a muskrat, and how she planted the seeds there, and they flourished and blossomed up into the air. And when the story was finished, the stone said, Henceforth it shall be the custom to give both the story and the storyteller a gift. So Crowboy took a bone bead he had in his pouch, and he placed it on the stone. And the stone said, If you are here tomorrow, I will tell you another story. And Crowboy went into his lodge, and he slept. And in the morning the sun rose, and he awoke, and he went out into the world. And for a moment the story he'd heard the night before seemed nothing but a dream. But as he walked out into the world, he saw that story again in the flourishing grasses and in the leaves of the trees. And he remembered that story in his heart. And that day he explored that forest, and he hunted songbirds there. And at dusk he returned to his lodge, and he roasted those songbirds over a fire. And he ate. And then he went to the edge of that stone, and he sat down. And he looked out at the two rivers becoming one. And he looked out at the stars and the darkness between them. And the stone spoke again and said, Would you like to hear a story? Yes, said Crowboy. And again he took some tobacco leaves from his pouch, and he held them up and dropped them down to the base of the cliff. And the stone began to speak. And the stone told him another marvelous long story about a boy who was raised by bears, and how the mother bear taught him about the three kinds of hunters you would find in the forest, about the ones called the heavy steppers, who made noise as they walked through the forest, and they were easy to escape from, and about the hunters who thought loud thoughts in their heads and even sang songs in their heads, 
and how because of this the bears could hear them coming from a long way off. And about the third kind of hunter, who had a clear mind, clear like a blue sky empty of clouds, and how these hunters were very hard to hear, and so they were very dangerous for the bears. So the stone told this story to Crowboy. And when it had finished, Crowboy took one of the birds he had roasted and placed it on the stone. And the stone said, If you are here tomorrow, I will tell you another story. And Crowboy went into his lodge, and he slept. And the stars shone down upon the world, and their starlight fell on the leaves of the trees and the waters of the rivers and on the stone. And the next day the sun rose, and Crowboy went out into the world and explored. And at night he came back and heard the stories of the stone. And day after day went like this. Every day he would return and hear stories from the stone, and by day he would explore the forest. And one day he came to a village, and he made friends with some hunters there. And they taught him how to catch larger animals, not just the songbirds, but guayo, the rabbit, and de Wajodes, the deer. And he took the hunters to his lodge, and they sat on the edge of the cliff, and they too heard the stories of the stone. So often he would bring the hunters there, and often they would teach him. But the stone never told a story unless Crowboy was there. So time went on, and eventually Crowboy fell in love with a young woman from that village. And they spent many happy days together, walking through the forest and telling each other their stories. And one day he went to her lodge, and he said, Please, my dear, I need a deerskin bag for my hunting. Can you please make me one? And she said, Man of my heart, my love, I have already made you such a bag, and here it is. And she gave him a beautiful deerskin bag decorated with beads. And then she said, And now we must go to your lodge, for my sister is jealous of the love which has blossomed between us, so you and I must live in your lodge. So they left the village and walked to his lodge. By this time it was autumn, and there was a cold wind in the air, and the leaves were beginning to fall from the trees. And that night they both sat on the cliff there. And when the stone began to speak, she was not surprised. In fact, she said, This stone is my grandfather, and I know many of his stories. So they lived there all through the autumn and all through the winter, as the stone told its stories to both of them. And then spring came and the birds returned to the trees. And she said, Now we must return to your village. But they treat me horribly there, he said. She laughed. Yes, I know, but that is where we must go. And she had a look in her eyes of great certainty, like the light of a star shining in the darkness. And so he did not question what she said. And that day they gathered their things, and they left the stone behind and walked down to the river. And there, at the edge of the river, was the canoe. This canoe is still here, he said. After that long winter, it's still here. And she said, Yes, I am the one who sent this canoe to you. I am the one who brought you here to hear the stories of the stone. So let us get in this canoe and return to your village. So they got into that canoe, and they took up their paddles, and they pushed off from the shore. And as they paddled, she sang songs, beautiful, marvelous songs, and he listened to these songs carefully and remembered every word and every note of these songs. And it was a beautiful day, and the sun shone in the sky, and there were clouds in that sky. And as he looked down at the water, he saw those clouds again in the water, a beautiful reflection, and it seemed to him as if they were paddling through the air. And a moment later, there was no sound as he put his paddle into that water, and it felt truly as if they were paddling through the air. And then a drop of water fell from his paddle and into the river. 
and in this way they paddled across that wide river and to the other side. And they brought their canoe up to that shore and they pulled it up into the sand. And then they began to walk through the forest towards his village. But they hadn't gone far when they came to a large hollow log. And here she stopped and said, Now, my love, my dear one, now you must take off your clothes and climb into this hollow log. What, he said? Yes, she said. You must take off your clothes and climb into this hollow log. And again there was a light in her eyes. And it was like the light of a fire devouring a log. And it was like the light of a star shining down onto the earth. So he took off his clothes and climbed into that hollow log. And it was dark and it was tight in there. And as he moved through that log, he thought of worms squeezing their way through the earth. And he thought of flowers muscling their way up out of the winter darkness into the light of the spring. And then he came out the other side and stood up. And when he did so, all the scars on the outside of his body were healed. And all the scars on the inside of his body were healed as well. And he was dressed in magnificent clothes. Now, she said, man of my heart, let us return to your village. So they walked through the forest until they came to his village. And the people welcomed them there and gathered round. And they said, who are you who comes in such marvelous clothes? Who are you who comes from so far away? Who are you travelers who have come to our village? And he said, I am the one you once called Crow Boy. I am the one you once called the Filth Covered One. I have returned, and I have brought you a gift. And that night, there was a bonfire, and all the people of the village gathered around that fire. And Crow Boy, who was now a man, he told them stories of the world before this one. And he told them the story of Sky Woman falling out of that world and onto the back of the great turtle. And he told them the story of the boy who was raised by bears, and many other stories as well. And when he finished telling stories, he said, Some of you will remember all of these stories. Some of you will forget half of them. Some of you will forget all of these stories. But you must do the best you can. This is the wisdom of the world which came before. And we must remember it as best we can. And the people gave him gifts. And then they went off to sleep. And the stars shone down in their ancient patterns into the world. And the next morning the sun rose and the people walked out into the world. And those stories they'd heard the night before, well, they seemed nothing but flimsy dreams. But as they walked out into the forest, they saw those stories again in the grasses and the flowers and the stones and the trees. And when they saw the stories there, they heard those stories again in their hearts. Thank you, Story, for visiting us here. And listener, whoever you are, dear listener, I invite you now to take a little breath, your own precious breath, and put it into your hands and offer it up to this story. 
Just give it away to the air that it may find its way to the earth. This story, give that breath of yours, give it to this story which comes from the Seneca people of Finger, the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York, which has been carried by them. Give that precious breath away also to the earth which carries this story and the earth which remembers all the stories. Thank you for doing that. And today I am pleased to welcome Miguel Rivera to the show. Miguel is a healer, a ceremony maker, and the translator of the poems of Humberto Acabal, a Guatemalan poet who is recognized around the world for his work. Miguel is here with us today, both to share some of his own wisdom and the wisdom of that poetry. Thanks for joining me, Miguel. You're welcome, Jane. Thank you for inviting me. Miguel, we've just heard this story from the Seneca people about a stone that teaches stories to a boy. Uh, do you have any thoughts about this story? Well, I think for me, it brings me back to my childhood because when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the voice of nature. I would spend hours listening to uh, water go over a stone and make song. So that was one of the things that I used to regulate myself. The world that I lived in was very... Um, should I say, had a lot of raucousness, a lot of disturbance in, 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 in the communities that I lived in, a lot of fighting in my family, a lot of fighting in the country, military dictatorships. And so the only way that I could regulate myself was by listening to the voice of the earth unbeknownst to me. So sound, water over rock was one thing that brought me peace, the sounds of birds at dawn. I used to get up and listen to the, to the dawn choruses of the birds when I used to spend time in my uncle's uh, and my aunt's coffee plantations, you know, three different plantations in the family. I would go back and forth. And that was one thing that, so the sounds of nature or the activities of nature in particular, the elements would always regulate me a lot. So that's one way that I got invited to participate. So in, in that, I uh, had the opportunity in 1995, my sister gifted me with a poetry book. And I had already been living in the United States for about 30, uh, 29 years. And so I was totally disconnected from my land. And when I opened up the book and started reading, I immediately went back to those childhood memories of water over stone, you know, lightning, storm, uh, dog, dawn choruses it, 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 uh, from all the different types of birds. And I realized, oh, this is a doorway back into a land that I knew. And that was the poetry of Humberto Acabal. Mm. So this is my, it, it, it kindled in me an interest in, in the world that I had forgotten existed, but it gave it a new uh, language, a new relationship. When I was a kid, everything in Guatemala in particular, everything that was Maya or indigenous or in, in, indigenous, as we say in Guatemala, was not necessarily respected. It was vilified in many, many cases. So there's a lot of embedded racism in the attitudes of, uh, of the people that are not of full blood um, uh, Maya <laughs> against them, you know, and including in my family, I have stories. I mean, I, one of my great grandfathers was Kiche, and, and the family denies it vehemently. So it was always difficult for me to understand why why that's so perpetrated. But mm -hmm. this this book in particular opened up a way that I could begin to see the world in a, in a, in a different way that I didn't even know existed in my own country. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to participate with that. Umberto and I became friends quickly. Um, I started reading the poetry uh, at the Robert Bly retreats in Minnesota in 1995, and he just went, let's do it, let's do a book. So I met, I met with Humberto at a cafe in uh, one of the main squares in, in, in the capital of Guatemala, Guatemala City, mm -hmm. and I asked him for permission to do this, and he goes, I will ask. And about a month later, I got a, I got a fax from him, <laughs> a fax, if you can imagine that, no email, not quite yet in those days. And all he said was the fire said yes. <laughs> so the permission to do the first book, or, or he went out and did a ceremony, obviously, and some made a prayer and his guides, ancestors, grandfathers said, we got permission to do this because they realized it was vital. And I see it as one of the, uh, one of the keys. I have felt that, um, in the wake of the European colonization of the globe, to put it that way, right? One of the things that's important is to be able to listen to the voice of the land. As in Western culture, we have objectified the, the, the world massively. And so we look at things as just things, not as living, breathing entities, as uh, beings that need to be related to, but just something. When you objectify something, you can do with it whatever you want which means no responsibility or accountability for your relationship to the earth in particular and all this being 
things. So one of the ways to de-objectify the world and create a relationship with it is to realize, realize and understand that it's a living, breathing being. And his poetry seems to do that in a very eloquent and very simple way. So you had mentioned one poem. Go ahead to recite that one. Well, as soon as I ran across this story, which again comes from the Seneca people in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York, I thought of the poem by Umberto Acabal called Stones. And that's a poem I used to recite often in Yosemite National Park when I worked there. Uh, Yosemite is a place with lots of stone, of course, and the stone there speaks in really interesting ways just around you all the time in its shapes and through its shapes. So I thought of that poem by him, which goes like this. Altars of the grandfathers, eternal listeners, hard in their silence, hard in their answers. And perhaps I should say I live in a landscape here in the Finger Lakes with a lot of stone as well of a different kind, layered stone. So the idea of history mm -hmm. and story and myth being remembered by the stone is, is wonderful to me. Do you want to read this poem in Spanish? Yes, me? I do. Piedras, altares de los abuelos, escuchas eternos, duras en su silencio, durísimas en sus respuestas. Lovely. Now, these poems, Humberto Acabal wrote them originally in Quiche Mayan and not in Spanish, correct? Yes, he did. He did. He did everything in Quiche first, and then he put it all in, in Spanish. So that the Spanish translation from Quiche, uh, the translation into Spanish from Quiche is all his, which is great because it means that the syntax, the cultural syntax embedded in the original construction of the thought, is carried into the Spanish. And so, and and I tried really hard to keep that in. I see that a lot with uh, some of the other poems like Vallejo, for instance, Neruda, and even with Lorca, when people translate those three in particular, because I'm, I'm always correcting them because there's an embedded lack, there's a, there's a lack of knowledge about the embedded thought process in the poem that gets lost in translation, right? You want to put it in English, but when you change the syntax, it changes how your body feels when you read the poem or when you listen to it. And to me, it's really important to maintain that because the whole idea is to make you feel differently, to open up a different sense, a different sensibility in your body. You know? That's amazing. And so if you hear the poem and a door doesn't open for you somehow, then something's missing. You don't have an example of that around, do you? But... Oh, <laughs> I don't have right now. I don't have I don't I don't have like because I've I've. I've I've worked really hard to purge those away from my psyche because I don't want to be polluted. I remember a story that Robert Bly told me once. He said one of the first translations of Neruda in English was done by a guy named Ben Bellet. Mm. It was published by, I can still, I, I remember reading that. And I, I had a, my one year in college, I had a literature, a Latin American literature teacher. He said, this is the worst translation ever. And so we would read the poems and you go and <laughs> and you, of course you go, what? it's like two different, but Neruda is so bulletproof that you can, you can mangle it and somehow the essence of the poem still come through, mm -hmm. right? But however, Bly said, these kids got up one morning and they drove all night to Ben Bell. They figured out where Ben Bellet lived and they knocked on his door like four in the morning and, he gets up and, he goes, blah, 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 and they said to him, no, stop translating Neruda, no more Neruda translations. And they left. That was it. Wow. <laughs> so That's intense. That's great. I, I remember that when I did when I did Umberto's books because I tried to really make uh, the essence of those poems come. Yeah. And I, we we use the poems all the time. I work with a lot of restorative justice um, modalities here in LA. There's a lot of groups that I work with, and we use poetry as a big way to open up kids that are in and out of gangs, in and out of prison, even with working with people in the military. And his poems always have a way of creating a, a, a he has a deep universality in them that it doesn't matter how they were written and they can be talking about very simple things. But for instance, like this one, El Fuego. El Fuego acuclillado apaga la tristeza del leño cantándole su ardiente canción. Y el leño le escucha consumiéndose hasta olvidar que fue árbol. The fire, the fire crouching eases the sadness of the log by singing to him the burning song or his burning song. And the log listens, consuming himself until he forgets that he once was a tree. So 
I remember like when, when that, when I understood that poem, when I finally got it, I was going, whoa, this is really, really, really intense because it shows you the transformation, the transformational nature of everything. And at that point in time, we are all in the same boat. It doesn't matter what part of the world you come from. We all suffer the same uh, challenges, you know, and the same blessings. It's humans. But to me, we're humans first. Men and women and everything in between, right, to, to stay current. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then come all the ethnic and socioeconomic brackets way at the bottom, you know. So as humans, we have to re-sanctify ourselves or reclaim our humanity. We're not, we're not in sync with ourselves and we're not in sync with the world around us. And this is what's really obvious by what's going on. Around, what's going on. When you look anywhere, you, everywhere you turn around to. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. And he says, what, a lot of his poems are used to uh, open up the ways. And, and I'll share part of this one. Some of them are extremely political, but they were written in such a way that you couldn't, um, you couldn't get in trouble. In Guatemala, it was a death sentence for many years to uh to read a poem especially if it was a political poem mm -hmm. so he had to figure out how to get around that right mm -hmm. so he said this uh, sanates sopes y palomas se paran sobre catedrales y palacios tan igual como piedras y árboles y se cagan sobre ellos con la libertad de quien sabe que la libertad y la justicia se llevan en el alma it's called freedom blackbirds buzzards and doves land on cathedrals and palaces just as they do on rocks, trees, and fences. And they shit on them with the complete freedom of someone that knows that liberty and justice are carried in the soul. Thank you, Miguel. And I just wanted to make it clear, we're reading poems from a book called Poems I Brought Down from the Mountain, which is poems by Humberto Acabal, A-K apostrophe A-B-A-L. And that was published in 1999. Yeah. So this worldview so, that comes through his poems, where um, it's, it's a very alive, you know, the fire is alive and has feelings, you know, and the log mm -hmm. does too. Um, that's a worldview you didn't really, it was around you, but you didn't really grow up with it so much. Well, I understood it in my body, but it was not a conceptual thing. It wasn't like taught to me by a grandfather. It wasn't taught to me by a grandmother. It wasn't, I wasn't taken out. Like I didn't understand this till I started spending time. I, I, ironically enough, I had to spend time with native Americans here in the United States before I understood what was embedded in my body already anyway. So I'm going, wow, I had to travel all the way over here, 3000 miles away to learn something that was that I, that I could have claimed in my, in, in my own country. But I was because of the cultural impositions, you know, uh, as the outcome of what to use that word, the, the conquest or colonization, I was basically separated from my own nature, as many of us are. We don't even know that we're disconnected from our own nature. Mm. So what's important now is to be able to teach this to the kids, to the generations that succeeded us, so that we don't keep passing on this craziness that we live in right now, you know. And don't you think all of us are in the same boat these days, including those of us descended from European Americans uh, way back when there were uh, folks who were descended from who lived with a indigenous, if I can use that word, uh, relationship to the land, don't you think? I, I suspect so, because everybody, um, one of his poems says this, right? Las raíces nos mandan a contar por medio de las flores como la tierra es por dentro. Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. That's the, the first half of the poem, right? And I think we are all that like that. Mm -hmm. We have a root a deeply embedded in all the way down to a, um, a creation type level. Mm -hmm. And so intrinsically, we are all connected to spirit in our own unique way. And it's our job, our task, our lifetime to get connected. And there's intermediary interference, right? And in between you and the source that com that confines your connection to source, whatever you want to call it, whatever philosophy, ism, is, you know, whether it's, you know, Presbyterian, Catholic, whatever it is, Hindu, somehow they always get in the middle and get, try to control your access to, 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 to essence. And I think this is a more direct way. In native philosophy, they call it hollow bone. You have a connective device that takes you and, 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 and then the transaction and directly between you and spirit or essence, soul, God, whatever you want to call it. And nobody in between, no priest, no imam, no rabbi, no nothing. You know, it's just you and spirit. Whatever happens, it's up to you, as they say. It's up to you as some of the people that I know. So it's really important to recognize. And this is what we have to reclaim. We don't have to be dictated by something, you know, an ism, 
right? That it involves taking the earth as teacher, right? Exactly, yeah, relationship. One of the things that's really critical for me is learning how to be in relationship. Uh, the, I had a talk earlier this morning with these people that are very interested in cultivating uh, a, a deeper relationship with plants. But I think it's not just plants, but it's participating with the universe around us. We don't reciprocate with the earth. You know, we don't give to the earth fully the way we should. And the way a lot of, I went to Peru for the very first time in 2008 and I was amazed. I had been told what it was like, but they have what they call um, despachos, which is rituals of recipro uh, reciprocation. Despacho is a Spanish word where you send a package to somebody. It's like somebody you're sending off a gift. Mm -hmm. So they do, they, they feed the earth on a regular basis there with these very elaborate ceremonies. They go down and put food answers. We do it here too in native ways in much, much different ways. But I think that uh, what's important is in particular, the European uh, countries have been disconnected from source for a long, long time. I had the opportunity to listen to somebody speak about the impact of the Roman conquest on Britain, right? And he said there was genocide practiced by the Romans in Britain. And, and what is it? Whenever they invaded uh, Britain, was it was in 74 AD. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, this is so, and they're saying we're still trying to recover. You know, so we have to go back into uh, some form of uh, an intrinsic relationship with the land and begin to listen to the message of the land. And this is what these poems are about, mm -hmm. spending time with the land, listening to the stories that the land has to tell. Whenever I work with people on, a, on an individual basis, uh, one of my tasks, I, I say, go make friends with a stone, with a body of water, either a lake, a river, or the ocean, or and a tree. <laughs> and tell your story to the earth and it's really important and you have to learn how to talk to plants as crazy as that sounds and as weird as it sounds is it is so interesting nature is always telling us something if we just go out there and listen because we're so uh, out of sync we're asynchronous with the world around us yeah. so to go back to the poems you know we, we have a new collection and what was interesting to me in 2003 i got uh, a friend of mine said hey, you should go check this out and it was a street festival here in LA called Echo Maya. Echo meaning echo as in reverberation, right? So it was all a bunch of Guatemalans that had been here in exile in, in the United States for a number of years. And they wanted to get together and figure out how to reconnect. And the one thing that was binding them all together was their connection to Maya heritage. Now, if you understand the irony about this is that in Guatemala, for me, when, especially when I was a kid, everything that was Maya was despised looked down upon and it was considered below and no intelligence and coarse and uncivilized mm -hmm. and here we were in la 40 some odd years later you know and with the one thing that bound us was the uh, connection to my heritage land right mm -hmm. and what's interesting about this weekend is that it took place over easter weekend right so on easter sunday morning i'm sitting there in my little booth trying to sell these poetry books you know and thinking the resurrection has taken place here but it's not connected to something that happened in mesopotamia or somewhere over there 2000 years ago is the land had mischievously seated itself inside of us and it was it was that's what was waking up was the maya root there was a medicine man here in, in california that i had the opportunity to spend time with a couple of times but he was very important in, in sharing something with us and he had no bones about sitting and participating in ceremony with anybody didn't matter what race you were from, where you came from, you came to pray, good, let's pray, let's make prayer. And he said this, everything that we are comes from the earth. The way we speak, the way we make our clothes, the way we hunt, the way we, everything. And if we ever lose that, we go back to the earth and the earth will tell us. And now here we are, you know, 2,000 years later, 5,000 years later, 15,000 years later, no matter how far we've been disconnected, and we have to go back and listen to the stories of the earth, the story, the song of the earth for that matter, you know, and this is the beauty of these poems. So I want to move, uh, if you don't mind, I can, we have a new collection of poems, it'll, it'll come out sometime in the second week in June, mm -hmm. being published by Tia Chucha Press, and also uh, through the University of Chicago, and due to COVID, uh, shenanigans you know everything is they have a massive backlog so this was supposed to be out a couple of months ago but now it's in the middle of june so some mysteriously there sometime in the middle of june if you go to tia chucha press website and university of chicago press and look for in the courtyard of the moon you will find uh, the new translation of poems and so some of these are from that and so the first one is says this in la voz in la voz 
En las voces de los árboles viejos recono reconozco la de mis abuelos. Veladores de siglos, su sueño está en las raíces. In the voice. In the voices of the old trees, I recognize those of my grandfathers. Guardians of the centuries, their dreams are in the roots. Mm. Going back to roots. Yeah. Love it. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. Miguel, real quick, can you spell the name of that press for our listeners just so they can find it? <laughs> tia, Tia, Tia Chucha, T-I-A, one word. It means ant in Spanish, right? And Chucha, C-H-U-C-H-A, Chucha. It's Great. a nickname for Luisa. It's one of the nicknames uh, for Luis, is Chucho, and for Luisa, is Chucha. <laughs> it also means female or male dog in some countries, so you have to be careful. I'm not offending anybody here, but Tia Chucha is Tia Luisa. This the 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 press is run by Luis Rodriguez, who's a, a dear friend of mine, you know. And so it's the name of his and it is a name of well, if one of his favorite aunts. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to take in that poem. The roots of the of all these things. Our grandparents are in the roots. Right. Very beautiful. Guardians of the centuries. Their dreams are in the roots. Their mm. dreams are in the roots. Yeah. This one is called Canto. El abuelo de la mano. Lleva a su nieto a saludar a los árboles, a platicar con ellos, a acariciar su piel, a oler sus hojas, y los árboles cantan sus nombres. Song. The grandfather takes his grandson's hand. Come, let's greet the trees. Talk to them. Feel their skin. Smell their leaves. Listen. And the trees sing their names. So how was it to take these into English? You've spoken a little bit about that, but you said the syntax sometimes in, in Spanish and especially in Quiche uh, communicates a world view. Are there any poems that were really especially hard to get into English or were they all about the same? Well, what's interesting for me is I have a very, because I grew up in Guatemala, somehow I feel, so I feel like his... Uh, uh, his poetry somehow is is be able to it comes through. It's easy to translate because it's not uh, it's not an intellectual uh, expression. It doesn't come from academia. Mm -hmm. Humberto, when he wrote poems, he would not go to dictionaries. He would go hang out in the marketplace, mm -hmm. or again, go sit and eat food there and walk around the streets. And this is where he would get his words, just by listening to the to the sounds of the village, of the sounds of the birds. And so. And, and I try to maintain that in the poem. And sometimes I would have to, I would like these, this, this particular collection, the first one, we moved pretty fast, but this one took about over 10 years to get this one together because I would, I would go through, I have, this is like 25 different iterations of this poem probably and many of them in there. Some of them are easily translatable, but some are just, you have to run over and over and over again to, to figure out how to change an article or a verb. Most native languages are not adjective uh, focused or verb focused, you know, so everything is verb to verb to verb to verb. So it's constant motion, constant transformation. And that's the one thing, English is an adjective or it's a noun based language, right? So everything is cut into little pieces and then little pieces, sometimes they, even though they're next to each other, they don't, they don't necessarily connect and you have to be careful to maintain that relationship. Like the fire poem that I, that I shared earlier, I must have been through 20 different versions of that one before I was driving. I remember driving on the freeway and I had to really understand what was happening there with the transformation so that I can, and I would run it over and over in my head when I finally got it, I go, oh, yeah, this is the way. And it's the same thing with these. And you have to be literal, you know, in the beginning, you know, this for that, and then figure out how to make it poetic, you know. And some people get lost in that process, you know, and you have to be willing to sit with them for a long time to, to let the poem speak. Like here's here's one right sixty four. Let me see if I can get this. this is interesting. Uh, Humberto told me that when when he um, he got a lot of criticism for this because people did not understand it. It was antes yo ladraba, antes yo ladraba, y no recuerdo en qué sueño se me olvidó esa costumbre. Ahora hablo. I barked before I used to bark, and I can't remember when. Which in which dream, which dream caused me to forget? Now I speak. <laughs> so you speaking. have to think about that. Barking and speaking, right? So 
most people will think, oh, it, it, but it has to do with your wild, your wild essence is connected to the world, right? You know, so that's important, you know, and I had to really, I'm going, why don't we go, why don't we go? And he said, don't, you gotta be careful if you're gonna put that one in the book, make sure that you, people understand what it's about because it's misunderstood, you know, at what level it's talking. And it's about talking about how we are disconnected from our own intrinsic nature, right? That's has to do with thunderstorms, you know, clouds, uh, fire, right? Rain, you know, hail, all those things. So it really has to do with domestication, right? That's what it's about, you know, and we are way, way, way too domesticated in some form or another. And we have to reclaim that, you know, like the difference between a wolf and a dog, right? Oh, uh, let's go back to our wolf nature. <laughs> Here's another good one. Los ríos platican. Los ríos platican con las piedras cuando los árboles duermen. Al amanecer, las piedras callan y los árboles cantan. The rivers talk. The rivers talk with stones while the trees are sleeping. At dawn, the stones go silent and the trees sing. La sombra esa. La sombra de esa hoja de nogal Camina sobre la pared como un murciélago buscando la oscuridad debajo del techo de la casa. Sobre la loma, el sol envejece un poco. That one shadow. The shadow of the walnut leaf walks on the wall like a bat looking for darkness under the roof of the house. Over the hill, the sun ages little by little. Oh, yeah. Give it. Can we hear that again? This is the radio, right? It's flowing river. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Let's, let's go back and linger. That one shadow, the shadow of that walnut leaf walks on the wall like a bat looking for darkness under the roof of the house. Over the hill, the sun ages little by little. <laughs> Even the sun ages little by little. Yeah. La neblina, aliento de los árboles. Se desmadeja entre las ramas del amanecer. The fog. The fog. Breath of trees unravels in the branches of dawn. <laughs> and of course, I have to read the one that the book is named after, you know. Please do. Los, yeah. In the courtyard los, of the moon. That's our time. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah right. mm -hmm. Los murciélagos y yo. Los murciélagos y yo. Esperábamos la llegada de la noche para jugar con las estrellas en el patio de la luna. The bats and I. The bats and I waiting on the arrival of the night to play with the stars in the courtyard of the moon. <laughs> Beautiful. Is he unusual for a Guatemalan poet or not? I mean... Uh... Yes, in a way, because he did not get caught up in all the political, uh, the, the, the political nonsense. There are some poems in there. There's a lot of sorrow. I, I got asked to do a, a reading for uh, middle school in San Diego County, San Diego public school system a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I started reading from both books and the kids right away. A lot of the kids that I was asked because the kids are all Canjoal. Cajual is one of the Maya tribes and uh, one of the Maya groups in northern, northwestern Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And the kids were saying his poems are very sad. I said, yes, that's the nature. Of, there's a lot of grief in, embedded in the culture, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but they love the fact that it gave them a voice, you know, in, in such a way so that it doesn't get caught up in the politics of the situation. You know, like there's um, a very famous poem, a poet from Guatemala, Otto René Castillo, who got killed. Uh, Castillo became a guerrero like many young people in Guatemala in those days. I mean, it, it's something that I had considered when I was 19 years old, I had to make a choice. I realized in those days, this is 1971, okay? And so the Vietnam War is raging, all the armed conflicts in Latin America are raging and what, what are we gonna do? We gotta create change. I realized that if you wanna create change in Latin America in particular, you would have to have a steady, strong something. I don't know what set up that, that it would take several generations to to actually course correct the right way without resorting to armed conflict. And I came to that conclusion because I realized that armed conflict is not necessarily the way. A lot of the ideology 
has failed miserably in many places. A lot of the revolutionary ideology, even though it's really cool stuff, is because the people haven't done the internal work uh, necessary to really live that ideology. Look at all, case in point, in Guatemala, I can say this with impunity because of what's happened in Guatemala. After the peace accords in 1996, the corruption embedded in the country with the, with the alliance, right, of the guerrillero groups and the military was the worst ever. And I was saying, what the hell happened to these people? You know, all this ideology out the door as soon as they get into power. And mm -hmm. that was terrible betrayal. Yeah. I talked to a mom in where I where I live, where I grew up. There's mom in Quiche, right? It's right in the border town. Where we where my city is, right where the, the city borders limit, that's the end of the Quiche. So in my in, in the colors that I should wear are Quiche colors, but you go five kilometers and it's mom. So I talked to a mom elder. One time we were, I was taking Tomas up, my son, Tomas. Well, I wanted to do a, 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 a blessing for him on one of these lagoons and it's called Chicabal. And it's basically a beautiful lagoon in, inside of a crater of an extinct volcano. So we, and this guy took us up. And so I started talking to him at the top of the volcano. And I said, tell me about the One of the guerrero groups that operated in that part of the country was called Orpa. Mm -hmm. or Organización Revolucionaria del Pueblo Armada, something like that, some huge acronym, uh, elegantly describing something. And so, and I said, tell me about the guerrilleros here. And he goes, he said, to, he looked at me, he goes, frankly, we had no idea what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were from the left, right? Yeah. They were from the left. Basically. They were hardcore Marxist intellectuals. I'm going to talk about irony, right? Yeah. If you have a hardcore Marxist, intellectual university, blah, 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 all that stuff. Can't explain to a native person what the hell the revolution is all about. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you got some explaining to do, right? I mean, seriously. <laughs> and yeah. this is what you're looking at. There's no interior work. I mean, that's what happened to Che Guevara. Guevara got turned in because he was stealing food from the natives. They had no idea who he was. They never bothered to learn the language, whatever, I think it's Aymara or whatever, whatever tribe was there in Bolivia, you know, mm -hmm. he just forgot, he, for, he forgot his manners, you know, right. really, and you realize uh, inside did not do the necessary, and this is anathema to most people, because Che is like a god in Latin America, but I don't think so, he, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of missing pieces there, and it's true of all the revolutions, you know, mm -hmm. so this, and I know I'm going around here, but what's important about this, this talks about reclaiming a part of ourselves that's that's sacred in a, in a, in a, in a way in which is not it defies conventional mm -hmm. uh, definitions it's not dictated by rome it's not dictated by martin luther in germany it's not dictated by something that came out of you know mesopotamia mm -hmm. if you ever read uh a play in the fields of the lord a peter matthiasen novel right mm -hmm. it's about these uh, missionaries that are in in somewhere down in south america trying to convert <laughs> people into christianity and the pilot that gets that, that gets tasked with taking them up the, one of these rivers says what, what are you guys what are you crazy you're trying to talk to the this this religion that you're trying to preach here these these were evangelicals right he said think of where it comes from it comes from the desert halfway across the world you know and you're trying to these this is the jungle rain people what do you how was it connected and I understand that 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 song of the earth for that land is true for that land. The song of the earth for this land is true for the song of the earth of this land. And this is what Umberto is talking about. But however, when you come, when you bring that song together, right, and this this song together, it's a whole different idea. Instead of trying to co-opt or force one song on, on another song, when, when they need to be in relationship not in in domination right so this is what this is about i think the poetry is about is, is, is about taking us to a place that's much deeper inside of us like like that roots poem mm -hmm. roots tell us through the flowers so our, our job is to connect to source that mm -hmm. primordial source that has no definition right when you study creation stories from all over the world i don't care where you come from they all start the same way in the beginning there was nothing it was dark, but the potential was there. So this poetry, and to me, in a way, is it takes us back there to some formless place that's filled with potential that can inform you at all. It, it didn't happen 15 billion years ago. It can happen now. Mm -hmm. you know? that's, what's, that's what's so beautiful about it to me. And yeah. it makes it universal. So, yeah. 
so many folks in this world right now are displaced from their place of origin. Uh, and if you look back a thousand years, it includes almost all of us, right? We came from somewhere else. Uh, who among us has been in the same place for seven generations, for example? So you come bringing one song in your bones, but the land has possibly a different song. So how, Miguel, do we negotiate the relationship between those two? We teach each other the songs. That's what's that's what left of our own devices, you know, throughout the politicians, throughout the economic leaders, throughout the religious leaders, people will make shelter and they will make food and they will learn each other's languages and so on. And this is what we have to do. So part of the task is to recreate the coming together of the cultures the way it ought to have happened, not the way that it did without the whole implication. Of the, so it's like it's already happened. Now we got to now we just got to patch it up. It, it happened 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, in some places, 500 years ago, you know. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I got invited to participate in, in Native ceremonies. I've been doing Native ceremonies for 40 years here in the United States. And I use the United States because America, to me, is, is, is a continent. It's not a country. When I came here to the United States, people say, oh, you're not American. I said, I am the American. I'm Central American. What's wrong? Don't you know your geography? And so... <laughs> So I school, I, to this day, I get very irritated. America, blah, blah, America. Well, what are you talking about? So there's a large amount of inner work that is required of us if we want to see the changes in the world that we'd like to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's critical. And if we don't do the inner work, it'll get reflected on the outside. And any, I mean, I had an interesting conversation um, two weeks ago. I was part of a restorative justice uh, uh posse that meets every year and they try to figure out what the, how to deal with the racism issues you know and i was thinking i've been listening to radical militant speech since the 60s i was about 10 years old right when i was a kid i used to stay up and tune on on the on the, i used to be able to i figured out how to listen to radio resta es radio habana cuba so i used to listen to speeches from fidel castro che Guevara, and all those guys when i was a kid trying to figure out what that was all about Heard all that, moved to New York, uh, hung out when um, in my year in college, they put me in what they called a third world corridor. It was filled. It had some people that were allegiant to the Black Panthers in New York. There was the equivalent in the Puerto Rican community called the Young Lords. So I listened to the Young Lords. I listened to the Black Panthers. I had friends that were in the SDS, you know, and I know people in the, where I was in college that were talking about joining the Weathermen. So I've heard militant speech from the 60s all the way to the to the to, to current times. So that's about 50 some odd years, right? And what happens to all those mil many of those militants are all gone by the wayside because they have failed to do the internal work. And so you hear all the militancy stuff now, it's morphed, you know, LGBTQ, and I, and people please don't get offended when you hear this, but you got to realize that. On the outside, on the surface, you can, it looks great. The ideology is beautiful. Anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, good. I don't mind that. But if you do not do the internal work necessary to carry out this ideology, all these isms will become wasms. The same thing with feminism, you know? All of it, reclaim yourself. So my idea is that we need to be reclaim, re-sanctify ourselves as human beings first. As human beings, all of us. We're prone to the same things. We can lie, we can cheat, we can steal, we can cook, we can bless, we can make poetry, we can make art, we can make beautiful things. All of that as human beings. Next, we're men and women and everything in between, right? And then come all the socioeconomic brackets and ethnic brackets, but we have to re-sanctify ourselves as human beings first, period. Let's do that first and then see what needs to, what needs to be done. And I don't, I don't want to put a, a quick Band-Aid or a coat of paint on any of this, but what's really important is to change the legacy. And, and you, start, you have to start by looking inside. And if you don't look inside, uh, a lot of things get overlooked. When you look inside, and these are not my words, these are words from Joseph Campbell, that the first thing you find when you go inside are all the monsters that are hiding under the bed and in the covers. And so this is what we have to deal with. And would you say that poetry is one way of doing that inner work? Poetry is definitely one way because it allows us to give language to how to re how to resanctify ourselves and how to connect to the world around us in a very simple, elegant way. I didn't have words for a lot of these things until I started working with this with this poetry in particular. You know, so that's this is important. Yeah. And you've brought these poems to uh, youth in a lot of situations. You said, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 The kids love them. 
I had a, a friend of mine uh, has a, a ranch uh, about 30 miles northwest of LA. He was in prison for 20 years and they got released and now he wants to work with 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 prisoners right so i went up they did a welcoming home ceremony they did it about three weeks ago in the north of la and two of the kids one of them was from guatemala and he was totally blown away when i started sharing the poems with him you know when you look at him he's you know a total maya profile we kept saying look at him he's just <laughs> great so it was really good to connect him to the poetry of guatemala because he had no idea and he has a history of drug abuse you know suicide attempts i you you name all that stuff but the poetry allows him to re-sanctify himself in a way that really watches him clean from all that guilt you know and all those things beautiful and with that in mind have you got a poem for us <laughs> which way do we go uh, we <laughs> la sombra cuando la noche. mi amor por vos ¿Cómo decirte? Es algo así como la lengua de un jaguar lamiendo a su cachorro. My love for you. My love for you is something like the tongue of a jaguar licking its cub. Its cub. <laughs> My love for you is something like the tongue of a jaguar licking its cub. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Can you tell us something about what these poems are like in Quiche? One of the things about Quiche, right, you know, to go back to some of the other poems, the older ones, is that, if, for instance, in particular, uh, onomatopoeia is a big part of the, uh, of the language. Mm -hmm. So in, in Guatemala in particular, all the, the names of the birds are the sounds that they make when you phonetically break down the chant. So the name of a bird is the this, this song, how it's translated into, into a physical or a word verbal thing. So you had asked for this, right? So I'm gonna read, this Please. is called bird, songs, bird songs, where is it? Cantos de pájaros, where is it? So those are simply the names of the birds in Quiche. Those are the names in Quiche, yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. Do you have the poem, That Is Why, handy? Uh, that's a beautiful uh, poem. So, page 93. Es yeah. por eso, oh, yeah. No solo por las estrellas, no solo por la luna, me gustan las noches. Cantan tecolotes, vuelan murciélagos, chispean luciérnagas. En la oscuridad el tiempo se detiene. Hasta me parece que como si caminara al revés. Es por eso. That is why. Not only for the stars, not only for the moon do I like the nights. I'll sing. Bats fly, fireflies spark. In the darkness, time stops himself. He even seems to be going backwards. That is why. <laughs> Do you think that's his what idea? The other one? That time is like a man? Or is that something in the culture? Hmm. Like the idea of time as a person? It's in the culture, but time as a person, but also time is... is uh, he was telling me one time we had a, a long conversation about the Popol Vuh. Mm -hmm. The Popol Vuh is the, um, uh, the Guatemala creation story, you know, the myth, how the world was made and everything that happened in between and all the, the mythology, the mythological creation story of Guatemala. And he said, when the Popol Vuh, it's supposed to be, it was written on, uh, on pieces of parchment that could be opened up like a, it was like a big tapestry that could be folded in any way, like an origami. So it, it was destined, it, it was, it was nonlinear. So time, depending on how you, you, how you want to look at it, it's nonlinear or circular, 
in different you can directions. unfold this book in, in yeah. different directions and it didn't matter and wherever you started that's where you started right and it and it was correct for the moment so time is random access right and it's also non-linear and circular when the whole idea came about the, the end of the world, the Maya calendar, remember that happened around 2010, whenever that was, ah, I sent them an email saying, what do you think about this? And I, his, his email had three short words, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> he goes, that whole thing is for us. It's not for you people, you know. He made a distinction. When I first met him, uh, we sat down and he pulled out a piece of paper and a pen and he said, this is you. And he drew a line and he said, this is me. And he drew a circle <laughs> and that's all. And that's all. He, and I said, well, I'm not that, I, I think I'm closer to you now than you think, you know? And he, so we, we went back and forth about that, but that's true. And so time is basically, it has no beginning and it has no end, right? It's random access and it's also linear. And it also has, so it has, it's not, um, it's not as dissected and as clear cut as it is in the Western mind. So time is very different that way. This one's called La Lluvia. Cuando de noche llueve, las flores salen de paseo. Los árboles hablan de sus cosas, cosas de antes, y lloran. The rain. When it rains at night, the flowers go out for a stroll. The trees talk, out, talk about their concerns, things from long ago, and they weep. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Is, I'll, I'll leave you three. This is the other one. El sol. El sol se mete entre tejas con esa terquedad de mirar que hay dentro de nuestras casitas. Y se pone pálido al ver que con su luz es más clara nuestra pobreza. Mm. The sun. The sun gets in between the roof tiles with the stubbornness of wanting to see what is inside our little houses. And he goes pale on seeing that our poverty is more obvious in his light. Right. Wow. So that's that's good. So I, I'm going to give you two short, two more short ones. And this one is hace tiempo. Hace mucho, mucho tiempo que te amo con ese amor escondido de las raíces que aman con toda la fuerza de la tierra hasta reventar en flor. It's been a while. For a long time, a long, long time, I have loved you with the hidden love of roots that with all of the power of the earth love until they burst into flower. Oh, yeah. Give us that again, Miguel. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. For a long, long time, I've loved you with the hidden love of roots that with all of the power of the earth love until they burst into flower. Right. So good. Yeah. Simple. And this is the last one. Is the blessing that I like to read. It's called La Respuesta. Please do. Abrir la tierra con las manos. Llenarse con su aroma. Levantar el rostro al cielo y comer el aire. Eso es la paz. Respondió la abuela. The answer. Open up the earth with your hand. Get filled with its scent. Raise your face to the sky and eat the wind. That is peace. The grandmother's answer. Miguel, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Jay, for having me. You can find more stories and interviews on my website, which is jayleeming.com. J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. Thanks, as always, to the Patreon supporters who help to make this possible. If you're able to join them, please do. That helps to get these stories out into the world where they can nourish all of us. For these stories don't belong to me. They belong to all of us. Take care. Thank you for joining me and be well.